Life is indeed worthy of being celebrated once you have it. For those who are well and alive, it is important that we celebrate ourselves. And because we are a unique set of people, people who are naturally endowed with love for one another, and that is what we always celebrate as we welcome you to Nigeria's longest running breakfast show, Morning Ride. I am Ololade Adini Jadili. On this week's episode of the program, we're basically going to be looking at celebrating our lives, um, well, getting back to our normal lives as it was before the advent of the coronavirus pandemic, but of course, bearing in mind that there is a new normal. Our children have resumed schools. Places of worship have also been uh, given the permission to resume. Some have, while some are yet to resume. It is important that we uh, have a discussion as to how we are expected to proceed from here. Our children, how do we keep them safe from contacting the coronavirus? What preparation have the schools made for these children? For the places of worship, what are our religious leaders expected to do? What are they expecting from their congregants? All of these are what we shall be looking at today on Morning Ride. I do hope you're going to have a good time with us. But first, let's start, as we usually do, by bringing you this musical clip. It is one that gives hope. It is one that gives life. Because love is life. Love gives hope. So let's take this music video by Chike, which he titles Nakupenda, which of course means love in Swahili. Do enjoy it. I know you're looking at me, you watch me like TV. You're looking at me three times in a row. If you want to say hello, just say hello. I think you look so pretty. You look like super dirty. Like you are needing some love. I don't know, but I've seen that look before. And if you don't say hello, I will say hello. Say hello. I used to be looking at him, but you're the one I'm feeling. Been looking at you four times in a row. I had to let you know. So I came to say hello. I know you need somebody, don't care about the money. You only need someone to hold you close And if you tell me no if you tell me no I'll still say hello Hello
Yes, that was Chike doing Naku Penda. Of course, we love you and we know you also love us. So having set the tone for the uh, show today, it's time for us to take a look at newspaper headlines that trended in the course of the week. And when we return, we will look at the papers for today. Do enjoy it. It's always a pleasure to have you join us on our review of newspapers during the week gone past on Morning Ride. We start with this day's newspaper on Monday 3rd, August 2020 with this cover story. Concern mount over loan agreement clause waiving Nigeria's sovereignty immunity with the riders. Experts fear repeat of fate of Zambia say waiver of immunity unconstitutional. Details on page 12. Above the masthead of the Monday edition of this day's newspaper was this bold headline. No stolen Nigerian crude oil in China. NMPC insists. More details on page 40. Other interesting stories still on the front page of this day's newspaper are low prices boost stock market by 113 billion naira in July. PDP governors to battle FG over alleged breaches of constitution. Sabotage prolonging insurgency war, says Bruno governor with the riders. Military takes delivery of new weapons for Northeast. Focus on rehabilitation of victims of violence, sans a tell FG. Details on pages 5, 8, and 12. Next is the Daily Sun newspaper on Tuesday 4th, August 2020, with this cover story. Schools in shaky resumption with the riders, partial reopening in Lagos, other states. Anambra, Kaduna, gear up to reopen August 5 and 10. Education Minister, Pam Sek, Torah Schools. More details on pages 8, 27, and 28. Beside the masthead, still on the front page of the Tuesday edition, was this bold headline, NDDC Contracts. Akpabio's new list sparks controversy with the writers Kalu Iburi Udraga, reply Niger Delta Minister. More details on page 20. Other stories on the front page of the Tuesday edition of the paper. A picture stories showing students of Ijegun Comprehensive Senior High School, Lagos, reopening hand washing items of government secondary school Wuse Zone 3 Abuja in readiness for school resumption students washing their hands in accordance with covid-19 guidelines in Lagos Buhari orders total overhaul of security strategies was the screaming headline that graced the front page of the Tribune newspaper on Wednesday 5th August 2020 with the writers says Nigeria now hard drug producing country Sultan can call for effective security of citizens. Governors meet today over degenerating security. Details on page 3. Other interesting stories above the masthead, still on the front page of the Wednesday edition of the Tribune newspaper, are sovereign immunity clause, diplomatic immunity, not same as commercial immunity, AGF tells NAS. Another alleged 6.2 billion naira palliative fraud hits NDDC with the Riders Distribution Committee Chairman Petitions Senate. Details on pages 4 and 29. The Nation newspaper on Thursday, 6th August 2020, had this lead story. Zulum governors await Buhari's response on attack with the Riders Masari takes banditry case to Villa. 12 fighter jets coming for Air Force. Revenue crisis may push budget deficit above 6 trillion naira. Was this cover story on the Guardian newspaper Friday 7th of August 2020 with the writers, government defies IMF on new taxes. Projects must generate returns to pay back debts. Operators ask for review of Physical Responsibility Act. Details on page 6. Still on the front page of the Friday edition of the Guardian newspaper is a picture story showing the Vice President Yemil Sibaju during a virtual meeting of the Economic Sustainability Plan Implementation Team at the State House Abuja. Below the picture story was this bold headline, 
Anarchy looms in a duel with the riders APC PDP in war of words as police occupy assembly complex. Crisis portends grave danger, Article warns. INEC threatens sanctions. CUPP says Nigeria sliding back to 1963. Details on page 6. For headlines trending on some of the foreign tabloids during the week gone past, we start with the West Australian of Tuesday, 4th August 2020, with this bold headline Melbourne Nightmare. City deserted as strict lockdown measures shut up businesses and forced residents to shelter at home. The National of the United Arab Emirates, Wednesday 5th of August 2020, focuses on one of the major disasters to occur this year with the headline, Blast Walk Beirut, coupled with pictures of the disaster and the riders' day of national mourning after explosion killed more than 50 and injured thousands. Still making reference to the blasts in Beirut, the China Daily of Thursday, 6th August 2020, had this headline, Z sends condolences in Beirut blasts. And lastly from the foreign tabloids is this headline from the UK Daily Express of Friday, 7th August 2020, with a bold headline, Boris, economy showing signs of strength. And that's it on the review of newspapers during the week gone past. Morning Ride continues shortly. Yes, those were the newspaper headlines that trended in the course of the week. And right now it's time for us to take a look at those headlines that we have for today talking about today's papers and the only newspaper that we have for review today is the Saturday Punch. We start of course um, just beside the masthead. On page 16, most dancers don't have health insurance, use drugs. That statement is credited to the internationally acclaimed um, dancer, Kafi. Next, below the masthead, Aisha Buhari flown to Dubai to treat neck pain. That is on page 9. And on page 17, Jonathan cautions against politics of bitterness. The boldest headline on the cover page of the Saturday Punch says, Edo Crisis, pro-APC lawmakers list Obaseki's sins in letter to Malami. And the writers, I won't recognize factional speaker, says Obaseki, attacks Ganduji. Edo governor, ignorant of constitutional order, says Tinumbu. Oshio Mole has hijacked Ize Yamu's campaign. That statement is credited to the DG APC Governors Forum. And of course, we have a picture of the governor of Edo State there. That story will be found on pages 7 and 17. Coming below that boldest headline to the left here, very interesting story, I must say. I won't return to husband who abandoned me, mother of two with blue eyes. That story is on page 11, and we see the pictures of both the mother and the two children. The three of them, incidentally, have blue eyes. On page 9, killings, Ohaneze, Afeniferi, Pandef, others storm southern Kaduna today. And on page 10, COVID-19, mixed reactions as court finds Naira Mali, 200,000 Naira. And on page, that's on page 10. Moving straight to page 24, Boko Haram ordered me to renounce Christianity or be another Leah Sharibu. That statement is credited to a freed victim of the Boko Haram, and it's on page 24. Still on page 24 also, we don't know where bomb that killed my brother came from. Sibling of Bruno attack victim. And on page 15, in line with our discussion for this morning, our Lagos Ogun churches won't reopen. That statement is credited to the MFM, the Mountain of Fire Ministries. Going to the back page of the Saturday Punch very quickly, Osime, I want to emulate Maradona at Napoli. And coming below that story is the bold headline here, FG eases ban on outdoor sports. Fans clamor for football return, and we see President Muhammad Buhari and some, the indoors um, of some sports here. 
Well, that's um, the headlines that we have for you. Basically, it's um, the things that we have been talking about in Nigeria. The situation in Edo State seems to be taking an alarming turn right now. And um, we, as usual on this program, we will just urge all parties to sheath their swords. It's the people that matter the most talking about, you know, their electorate. When it's time, they will go to the polls to make their choice of who exactly they want as the governor. But till then, let's all sheath our swords and see what that will bring for us. It's still morning, right? Let's take a quick break now. When we return, I want to believe my very first guest is waiting in the wings. But let's take this break first. What does it take to get ahead in today's world? To get your dream job? The perfect girl? Even a table at your favorite dance club? It takes moving fast. It takes moving at the speed of 4G. With Intel 4G LTE, you've got it all covered. That's because you have access to super fast unlimited data that enables you move as fast as the speed of life. Now, no download is too heavy. No conversation too long. Nothing is impossible. Get Intel 4G LTE Advanced today and do so much more. Intel. Live more. Imagine this. Your friend says to you, Hey man, look what my big bro sent to me. It appears there's an easy way to stop the virus from entering your body. And then you say, Oh wow, please forward it to me, let me share. And then you send it to one person who sends it to other people and they share it with other people. All without verifying this information. This misinformation might get more people infected and lives lost. Now, imagine this. Your friend says to you, Hey man, look what my big bro sent to me. It appears there's an easy way to stop the virus from entering your body. And then you say, How sure are you this information is legit? Is it from the WHO or the NCDC websites? Dude, please verify every information about the coronavirus from the NCDC or the WHO websites. Well, you see, you have just stopped the spread of fake info. Remember to tell your big bro, WhatsApp info does not mean correct info. Think about it. Latest technology. Welcome to Intel 4G LTE Advanced and experience super fast internet access today. Visit intel.com.ng or any of our stores in Lagos, Abuja, and Port Harcourt to get started. Intel. Live more. Glad to know you're still here with us. The program is Morning Ride. And um, like I said, my guest is actually waiting in the wings. Our children have been asked to return to school. Parents have been asked to, you know, send their kids back to school, especially those kids, those children that are in, um, you know, the entrance, the examination classes, talking about the final year students. Now, the Lagos State Government has put in a lot of efforts to ensure that um, our children are safe. But it is important that we actually hear and know what exactly has been done and what um, is required of parents and even the students. And joining us for this discussion, I have with me the Honorable Commissioner of Education, Lagos State, in person of Mrs. Folasha De Adefisayo. Good morning, Honorable Commissioner. I'm glad to have you here with us. 
thank you for having me. Good morning. Thank you too for joining us. Now our children have returned to school. What are the measures that have been put in place to ensure that these children are safe and that they do not contact the coronavirus? Well, we are, we are doing, a, we, we have put in place a number of measures. We actually working with the federal government and uh, development partners, private schools and so on. We put uh, together a document, guidelines and protocols on opening of schools. And uh, we agreed that we would hold our own, our own public schools to the same standard that we hold the uh, private schools. So uh, these protocols include things like social distance, how many students per class, uh, we are doing a minimum, we are doing between 20 and 30. Maximum, no class should exceed 30, and 30 would be a large class. At the entrance of every school, we have put in wash hand basins and uh, soap together with um, hand sanitizers. That's to ensure that as students are coming in, we take their temperature, they wash their hands, they go to their classes, and of course, no mask, no entry. And uh, Governor, Governor Wabajide Olushala from Wulu has issued masks to every child across SS3 in the state. So I think those are some of the measures. And of course, we are asking the same of our teachers as well. Because um, while we must protect the children, we must protect the teachers who are teaching them. Exactly. And the teachers, uh, too, are held up to the same requirements, washing of hands, temperature taking, social distance, and, uh, and so on. So these are no visitors in school. These are some okay. of the measures that we are taking. Okay. This, um, this is only for day students, right? Only for, pardon? Only for day I students. Mean, only for day students. Boarding students are not... Uh, I mean, how are you handling the situation of boarding uh, house students? Oh, the boarding houses, so since they are the only ones in school, they will spread across the whole school. Okay. or social distance. They mustn't go back to their old dormitories. What you do is you make sure that you spread across the school, obeying the laws of social distance of six feet between each child. Mm. So it's exactly the same requirements, but in the boarding houses. And of course, we expect every school to have fumigated their school before opening, which we did as well. So all those things are in place. Okay. Now, you mentioned that it's a maximum of 30 students in a class. And I'm wondering, I'm, uh, I'm wondering here, isn't this rather large, considering the fact that it is only the students that are in the examination classes, I mean, those final year students that are allowed in school, do we still need yes. to have as many as 30 to really ensure social distancing amongst the students? Because I'm wondering the, the how big the is the class? The are about 2022. 20, Okay. 20. Are, because I've been to so many schools myself, and uh, I have reports coming in from the field as well. Most of the classes, if it gets to 30, they are using the assembly hall or something. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right. Mm. Now, moving, moving away from, um, you know, the number of students in the school, in each class, I'm wondering now, and I'm sure a lot of our viewers too, because parents have expressed a lot of concern. Ch these are children. Yes, we know that some of them are teenagers, but be that as it may, how are we expected to keep these children away from close interactions that, you know, could, because they mingle, they relate, they, uh, you know, backslap one another, they hug one another. How are we supposed to prevent all of this amongst the children? Is it possible? It is, well, we've told them what they should do. We've told them, um, we've given them a lot of, uh, there are a lot of pep talks about all this. And we are also ensuring that in schools, we're not gathering. Like, we're not doing things like assembly. We're not doing things like lunch. No, nothing like break time. And that's why they're closing a bit early so they can go home and eat. So that we ensure that the, 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 the children are, hardly have activities that require for them to be close. You cannot eliminate the odd students who will play with each other. But as much as possible for a school, we've done everything we can to minimize contact. In all of this, I'm sure you will agree with me that despite all the um, public advocacy messages that have been put out by various media, by the government, the efforts of the government. We see Mr. Governor coming up almost every other day to brief Lagosians and to educate us. In spite of all of this, quite a lot of Niger Nigerians and Lagosians, of course, are still of the opinion that um, 
COVID-19 is a ruse and it is not real, which is quite unfortunate. Now, for these children that are coming, and even teachers that are coming in, I'm sure a lot of them have this mindset. How do we begin to change their mindset in terms of their psychology to see that this is real? I'm, I'm not sure that we, we can make such a sweeping statement, especially because many of the teachers, because even in preparing the protocols, the National Union of Teachers came out very strongly. They are very concerned about their members because, of course, teachers are much older than the children and therefore are likely to have a lower level of immunity. So they are very worried about the health of their, of their constituents. And so it's quite clear that teachers are aware. And we keep on talking. There are lots of, uh, if you go around many of, many of the schools I went to, public and private, there are all sorts of um, post, uh, posters all over the school warning them, telling them COVID is real, telling them the symptoms. And remember, the, uh, the symptoms are so many and differ from, every, from one person to the other. Mm. So that is one of the reasons why it's quite difficult to say this person has COVID or he doesn't have COVID. But um, we keep on talking to the students and I've talked to many of them. Okay. They actually are worried themselves and are determined to do everything they can to keep safe. All right. Well, I would want to agree with you here, but um, I made that statement based on our interactions with a lot of people that we have spoken to both on and off camera. Now, moving away, the exams are going to be starting on the 17th of August. At least uh, YAC is going to be starting on the 17th of August. For how long is this going to last? How long, for how much longer do we expect to see the students in school? Maybe like five or six weeks, but don't forget that NECO starts immediately after WAEC. Wow. So some students are going to be in school till about November. Till November? But school... Yeah, those that are doing NECO. NECO okay. was, was. Okay. Now, any yeah. hope for the other students that are not in this final examination classes? I mean, any, anything in the offing in terms of um, resumption? Are we hoping for schools to resume anytime soon? I, I'm sorry, I cannot answer that question because it's a nationwide uh, issue. Okay. That will be decided nationally. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, finally, as we round off this discussion, Honorable Commissioner, I just want you to, um, as we usually ask our guests to do on this show, speak to the consciousness of the students, the teachers, parents at home especially also, who are sending these children out on a daily basis to go get educated. Well, I, I, I know that these are difficult and turbulent times. These are very unusual times. But I will counsel parents and uh, teachers and students that COVID is a reality. It's a reality. I don't doubt that some people think it's a myth, but it is reality. But at the same time, one thing is clear, that it's not going anywhere. I don't think it's going any. I don't think we can say, oh, we'll wait until it goes. I think we just have to learn to live with it. And so learning to live with it, this is the first phase in learning to live with it, so that the older children come back and they start to imbibe the principles of social distance. And so I urge parents, please just support your students, your children, give them masks, keep talking to them at home. Don't allow them to go out and play on the streets. And, and, and certainly don't allow them to get engaged in contact sports. They are doing work. Let them study. Work is a serious exam. I always tell people, it's like a gatekeeper. If it's locked against you, you can't enter into that compound. So you must ensure that they study hard so that that gate will be open and they'll be able to go on and achieve their full potential. I urge the students to, to remain focused. This is school. These are serious times. We wish you all the best. We ask God to take control and to ensure that everything that you do will come to will come possibly come out properly. I thank uh, teachers who are in the forefront of all this working bravely and uh, courageously even though they don't know what tomorrow may bring and i counsel them that uh, the teachers do what they say is in heaven but we know now that we teachers will now start getting some of this reward here and i pray that will be your own portion so i and i and like i always say let us not forget the god factor in everything that we do Parents, teachers, students, let's put God first and remain prayerful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Commissioner for Education, Mrs. Folasha Day at Defisayo. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you. 
I have been speaking with the Honorable Commissioner of um, Education, Lagos State, in person of Mrs. Falashade Adifisayo, and she's told us all the protocols that have been put in place for our children in Lagos State to have um, a smooth run in school and stay safe from the coronavirus pandemic. Schools have opened not just in Lagos, but across Nigeria. Now we took a quick trip to the Federal Capital Territory to find out preparation uh, that have been put in place, the protocols that have been put in place for schools to resume. Let's see what we brought back for you. You know, we are transitioning into blended learning. It's a hybrid type of education. I'm not sure that all the children will be coming back into physical structures. So there will be a lot of children that probably will be learning from home. So we are going to, you know, that's why the training occurred because we're going to be teaching in class and also teaching the children at home at the same time. What we have, uh, we have stationed hand washing stations around the school. When you're coming in, um, you must go and wash your hands first, and then um, if once you get into the reception area, you're giving the sanitizer. We also have some kind of mist fumigation uh, thing so that it decontaminates you as a person. It's very safe, so it doesn't uh, it doesn't hurt or harm any child in any way. We we will advise parents to stay outside the gate, just hand the children over to us and then we bring them into the, so that they contact us and a small isolation room for anything that is, that comes up, God forbid. So different things. That's why Lakeland School is introducing the blended learning system, whereby as classes are going on in the physical structure, it's also going on online. So the children can be at home and learning I've seen their teacher teaching the other children in class at the same time. So that's what we are going into. That um, was um, a school proprietor there telling us about what and what they have done and what they are doing to ensure that um, the children are prepared, the school itself is prepared, the teachers are prepared because all hands must indeed be on deck. Our children are our future, and we cannot afford to gamble with our future. We cannot afford for children to bring the COVID-19 back home to parents, especially the elderly. It's still morning, right? It's time for us now to take a look at our health as we join Dr. Mimuna Kadri and Dr. Martina Agberi on The Physicians. physicians today we'll be discussing childhood cancers childhood cancers adults have cancer children also have cancer it is actually very heart wrecking but it is what it is this is the physicians where your health is our business my name is Dr. Martina Agbiri. Dr. Memula Yusuf Kadiri. Welcome to the physicians. With us today is an expert who will be dealing on this very important topic childhood cancer dr wobi dr wobi yes ma'am welcome to the physicians thank you Adam. just want to tell us about the childhood cancers that you know and the ones that are prevalent in our country in nigeria have, um, the most the most prevalent for that, that that we see are cancer of the kidney wind tumor or nephroblastoma we have the leukemias we have lymphoblastomas um okay lympho lymphoblastomas uh, blastoma. are Cancer, cancer of, of the lymph nodes, okay. more like, you know. Okay. The well, lymph nodes well, are responsible for draining. For draining and all that. You know, I, I always I tell this, you know, this story that as, as children, when we play outside, you have an injury, 
mm. by the next day or two, you have what you know, it's called cocoa. Mm, yes, around it's the point around the head, groin. You know, the child that have cough, you know, have mm. the cocoa so under. Yes, you understand. So those small, small, small um, nodes are actually lymph nodes, and there are some that are inside of our body. So any of these lymph nodes can become cancerous. Mm. So those lymph nodes. You said mm. now. Yeah. So those those lymph nodes, you know, can become cancerous. They are they are called lymphomas. You okay. know, so the lymphomas are one of the commonest ones that um, that we see. We have osteoblastoma okay. too. That's cancer of the bone. Cancer of the bone. Okay. So these are, are are the ones that that we see, you know, more than others. Syndrome and um, and uh, the leukemias mm. are associated. If you see a child a, a child with Down syndrome having leukemia, you won't be overly surprised okay. but, then, but there's no cause and effect we say that because this child has down syndrome the child must yes. have leukemia you understand so th there are no particular cause you know causes that this this person you know came down with childhood cancer because of so and so and so and so, mm. and so. but then again talking about radiation you know, you know okay. about the hiroshima um, um nuclear bomb and yeah. all that and then yes. how you know, many kids Exposure. who were born around that yes. that area had leukemia you know, because not even the children. So, how do they present? Yeah. Like um, the symptoms, the children. Yeah. The there is um, what we call the sensorial signs. Okay. Yeah. These sensorial signs are signs that are coined by the uh, SIOP. SIOP is International Society for Pediatric Oncologists, okay. and these people came together to give these signs and symptoms. So that anybody, whether educated, whether a mm. doctor, whether a layman, once they see, mm. should actually alert them to start thinking, can this possibly be cancer in this child? Mm. So the S is for seek medical advice for whatever it is that you, you don't under, understand, understand. Okay. you know, and of course, it goes, to, you know, that, that there's no way you see something in your child and you will not want to know what exactly is. is causing that yeah. thing. The eye is for our eyes. Any changes in the, the eye, eye a new squint, um, bruise around the, the eye, you know, whatever Redness, it is that, that, anything, that, change, anything that does that change yeah, in the eye, okay. please take that child immediately for further investigation. The air is for lumps anyway, okay. just like we talk about the lymph nodes, we could actually have, you know, swellings in the body. The U is for any unknown, just like the S, any, you know, you see a child bleeding into the urine, the child um, having fever consistently, okay. Okay. and there's no cure. You've mm. treated for malaria, you've treated for urinary tract infection. Meanwhile, the thing is still ongoing. You know, that child should be investigated. The A is for aches, fractures, whatever it is mm. that, you know, is not usual for that child. You know, because we have um, similar signs and symptoms that could be um, innocent, like let's say fever, anemia, bone pain which we see in malaria yeah. occurring to in in a, it is like leukemia mm. you understand so whatever it is that, that you're not comfortable with please take that child to for further, for further investigation okay. the end is for neurological signs okay. you know early morning vomiting projectile vomiting uh, change in the pattern of the child's walking okay. the pressure in the child that was formerly um happy okay. doing poorly in school, mm. constant headaches, could there be any, you know, space of fine lesion mm. in the child's um, skull, that child should be investigated. So that, wow. that is the, the sensorial signs. Well, are there children that are more at risk of having childhood cancer than other children? And like I said, people like maybe a child that, 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 that has Down syndrome, for instance. Okay. But then you yeah. see, the thing about it is that, let's take a, a cancer like a neuroblastoma. Mm. Abroad, there are, are tests that are done while the mother is pregnant, pregnant. Actually in families that, that have experienced such, you know, so you, you, have, you have the mother, they take the amniotic fluid and test, mm. and if it is positive, then now that baby is followed up for life, so that if the cancer does come up, they are on it, mm. and they're able to help the child as quickly. They said 25 by 25, that's 25% 25 cure rate by okay, 2025. 25, yeah. We have less than that. They are now talking about 60% by 2030. Yeah. And I'm saying, let us even get it to, to you know, to 30, mm. you know, by 2025, yeah, and then see how how it goes. You know, abroad, we have up to between 80 and 90% cure rate.
on the 15th that, that was that was uh, the International Child Cancer Day, we actually went to loot and mm -hmm. talking with the parents mm. there, there were 11 parents or 11 children on, on admission. admission. Out of the 11 parents, none of them had any idea that their children can have cancer. Wow. Talking of Nigerian children. children. We've uh, asked other parents, out of 10 parents, for instance, nine had no idea, idea that children can have cancer. Maybe the tenth one will have heard it or mm. seen it on the TV, but does not attribute it to Nigerian children. Mm -hmm. No, it does not happen to blacks. You know, mm. black children is an good thing. thing. It's not a Nigerian thing. Yeah, so that's you know. And then again, we've seen children who had cancer. There's the stigma, yeah. which at the beginning I was quite surprised to notice. You know, because a child has cancer, the child has some tumor the parents will send the child to the village. Mm. You understand? We've had, you know, quite a couple of, of that, you know. Dr. Mestre was, was, was talking about, about cancer affecting the family structure. It does affect it totally. Mm. Unfortunately, our fathers sometimes behave very funny. Mm. We've had fathers who have come to us to ask um, for DNA testing. Just well, seriously thinking yeah, that the child is, is not yeah, here. Like, even wiser than I, than I was then, because I, I was like, DNA, I, I actually thought, because the, the man's child had, um, this particular one, his uh, daughter had uh, leukemia. Mm. So when he talked about DNA, I thought maybe, you know, he was trying to find out the particular leukemia so he can mm. attack it squarely. <laughs> it was the nurse that was <laughs> telling me, that, that is not his You don't know these kind of people. No, don't be like that. You won't know if it's picking or picking. Can you imagine? You know, and at that time, the cost of the DNA test was one thousand hmm. dollars. It was about one fifty-six naira per dollar. That then, thing. Even if it's not his child, and that is it. Because we have people that carry for yes. cancer even patients that are not, that don't belong. So to if them. he finds out that it's not his child, what would he? What would he, he was. He, he, so uh, talking with him, you know, I said to him, I called him. I said that why do you want to do the DNA test? Say ah, you know, be a woman. See, for my place, would they ask us before we marry? Mm. Me, I ask question for my family. Can't I know my family? For my wife, family, no cancer. So that means this weekend, it's not a way match. Can you imagine? Uh, uh, the one of them, the one, one of them that was sent to the village, when the child, when the child's maternal grandmother that he was staying with died, the mother went for her mother's burial. On coming back, she came back with the child. The man, her husband, the man, refused the boy's father, refused in. for that child to enter into his home. So uh, straight away she came for admission and admitted the child, and that was where the child was until the child passed. Oh, you know, no. we have families whose um, financial situation changes Change. because somebody has to stay in the world with the child. Most times, that person staying will lose his or her job. job. Yeah. So these are some of the effects of uh, having mm, a child, child with cancer. With cancer. cancer. Yes. Family, how do you protect the family? First of all, even the Admission fees mm, are subsidized or country like Rwanda in. for children is free. Rwanda, Rwanda is in Africa. Yes, Let so me remind you. Yes, so it's free. Yes, we've had you know families go for, from Nigeria to Rwanda for free child cancer treatment. Wow, you understand? Do so they take them there? For, do they accept them because they are Nigeria? They, they accept some of them. But what is the survival rate? Like I said, it's roughly about 20 25 percent right now. Right now, and we are hoping to achieve 20 by 2030. WHO says we should aim to achieve 60 percent. What do you think? 20 is 30 it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it achievable? Is it achievable? I, That's a deep side. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to believe that you know, there with is more a, awareness, okay, we would get there. Thank mm. you very much, Dr. Obi, for coming on this program. Thank, Thank you. you. Actually enlightening a lot of people out there on childhood cancers. On the physician, we always try our best, and policymakers out there watching, please, we are pleading, we are begging, we are asking, let something be done. Parents shouldn't lose their jobs because they're taking care of their children. They're not protected with NHIS. Where else do you want them to go to? Yeah. Where do you want them to seek help? That child in hospital needs help. And the only help that they can render, the parents can actually offer, apart from sitting with the child in the hospital, is the financial help. Same time, just ensure you keep it there with the physicians. Always ensure you don't miss any, any day when the physicians come up. As usual, my name still remains Dr. Martina Agbeye.
And I am Dr. Memuna Yusuf Kadri. Please endeavor to follow us on all our social media platforms. Log in, send your comments. If you want to be a part of this show, we are an email you know, close to you. Till next time, goodbye and stay blessed. Yes, indeed, it is important that we stay healthy. And, um, well, cancer is something that we all must try to battle as best as we can. It's still morning, right? And it's time for our next discussion right now. We're still talking about the reopening of Nigeria generally. We've talked about the reopening of schools. It's time now for us to look at the reopening of worship centers. And to discuss this, I have joining me on the program today, a representative of the Christian faith and a representative of the Islamic faith. And for the Christian faith, we have joining us Pastor Tokumbo Shubululua. Pastor, Pastor Talks, as we always call you. Good morning, and how are you, sir? I'm blessed. How are you, too? How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Also joining oh, thank us... Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Joining us as well is um, Imam Abdul Karim Shafiu Majemu, of his hair to represent the Islamic faith. Imam, good morning, and how are you too? Well, it looks like we cannot hear Imam um, this morning, but I'm sure he will join us once the audio is better from his end. Now, I'll start with you, Pastor Talks. The, re okay. the, the worship centers have been um, asked to reopen we are now wondering on this program and on behalf of um, Lagosians and Nigerians, how ready are our places of worship? How ready are our churches for the reopening? All right. Thank you for that question. The truth is that we are very ready. In fact, we have been anticipating this reopening for a long time. Right where we are, that I am pastoring, the Rinkusen Church of God, Kingsway Palace. In fact, for the past two months, we had thought that the church would be open. And all through that time, we have been getting ready. And we used the opportunity to renovate the church because that would have been almost impossible if all services were going on. The Bible said that all things work together for good. So it works better for our good. The church was renovated. And in addition to that, the Rebuild Christian Church of God is a mission that normally um, put into condition the safety and respect of the people. So all the stipulated regulations we have put in place. At the entrance and exit point, we have um, hand washing equipment. We have the water running. We have sensor taps so that nobody will need to touch any of the taps before washing their hands. Oh. And we also have the um, hand dryer that we are getting to put. We are putting that also in place. And also the sanitizer, automatically dispense sanitizer. We are putting in place. The social distancing has already also been put in place. In the Dickinson Church of God, we have a body that uh, we are under, and some senior pastors have been made to go around all the parishes to ensure the compliance with COVID 19 um, rules and regulations. And for example, in the parish that I pastor, a senior pastor was around over the week, in the course of the week, to Put to ensure our compliance, and I to have to go to some other parishes that are being assigned to. So in the Ring Central of God, we are very much ready. In addition to this, we are making available some tablets that the registration of people that will be coming to the church for each of the services okay. will be done, so that there won't be any contact. We are going to be encouraging people to do um, electronic transfer of their offering. But the option of having the offering basket placed at different portion of the auditorium it will also be put in place. We will have extra uh, face masks 
for people that might forget their okay. face mask at home. Mm -hmm. And at the entrances and exit point, we are having some um, graphic illustration and writing. No face mask, no entry. Mm -hmm. Then inside the auditorium, we are also putting up some graphics at different points in the auditorium to get people reminded that there shouldn't be any hugging, no hugging, hmm. no high five, hmm. no handshake okay. in the auditorium. Each of our services, we are going to be having five services wow. so that we'll thin out and spread out the number of people that will be coming at any point in time. Okay. Each service will not go beyond 55 minutes. Fantastic. Which immediately after each of the services, we we'll have our team, we call them C19 compliance team. Okay. They are in-house people that have constituted that team. They are going to help us to disinfect wow. the auditorium wow. before the next service will Commences. start. Okay. They are uniform people. We are, giving, we are going to kit them very well so that they will be able to do that um, assignment. Mm. And uh, we also put in, in place something special that in the course of the service at the beginning of the service we are going to be having a sort of a jingle or an advert or a video play out for okay. about one two minutes that will remind the worshippers of the do's and don'ts okay. of who they are coming into the church so that they will not relax and forget about this thing mm. what you mm. should do when you get to church what you should do when you are in church, immediately after the church, no um, gathering anyway, is going to be played on all the screens that we have in the church as they uh, enter at the beginning of each of these services. Okay. And, uh, all yeah, right. All right, Thank Pastor you. Talks. We see that um, you have put in place so much, and you, you, you're obviously ready um, for the commencement of services. But um, um, Imam Abdul Karim, can you hear, I mean, I don't know if um, your audio is back with us now. We want to know from the Islamic perspective, the readiness of the mosque. We've had um, some, um, you know, worships at the mosque so far. How ready are we Islamically? Uh, thank you once again for having me. Thank you. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, I would also like to commend the, uh, my uh, able friend, Pastor, uh, uh, for his, that good contribution. Well, for the Muslims, I think uh, if I should go by what the, my uh, colleague pastor uh, has just said, I think, don't think we have all that ready. We are ready to go back to our places of worship, but in the real sense, uh, in terms of putting uh, all the regulations and those things that we need to actually um, contain the spread of COVID-19 in our mosque, uh, I don't think we have all that ready. Some mosques, because of their uh, largeness, because they are very huge and they have a lot of resources to do that, they are doing that already. But most of the mosques are not uh, ready in, as regards uh, putting up all the, uh, I mean, the, the requirements that is needed to contain the spread of COVID-19 in the mosque. Uh, apart from the fact that our religion actually um, allows us to, uh, it's part of our right, religious right, to perform ablution, ablution yeah. which is some parts of our body uh, before going to the mosque, and uh, which also gives us the opportunity to have some uh, liquid soap uh, being uh, put around the mosque for people. These have been done even before. Now, we have some mosques that have some liquid soap when you go to the toilet, coming out, going to the ablution area to uh, perform your ablution. But sincerely speaking, in terms of monitoring and also educating our people before coming to the mosque yes. and doing certain things as regards um, COVID-19, containment of COVID, uh, spread of COVID-19, we don't have that. We don't have that. Hmm. Um, some mosques, Already, they have mapped out the, um, the the standpoint. I mean, when the assembly, yeah. where you pull for solat, that uh, to actually give room for spacing, that had been done. Okay. We also have plenty of uh, people actually washing their hands properly before coming into the mosque. Also, avoiding 
hugging. I mean, when Physical. you know, it's part of our rite in the mosque. After every prayer, we do handshake. Aha. That, salamu alaikum, salamu alaikum, uh, wishing ourselves peace. Yes. Um, but this uh, will not be encouraged, and I think that has been also been uh, maintained by uh, the prayers yesterday. Okay. We, from our angle, yesterday I didn't open my mosque for okay. Jumat prayer. Okay. And the reason for that is that one, the, the, the caliber of people I lead are not yet confident of coming out to actually observe Jumat yet. Hmm. So, is that we need to do, to decontaminate the mosque. For instance, the mosque that has been deserted for close to about four months, <clears throat> even without COVID-19, it is very, very hygienic of you to, to actually decontaminate, to decontaminate that yes. environment before moving in. So at the point, the government announced that we should go back to mosque uh, till Friday, yesterday, we couldn't do that. Okay. So for that reason, we felt people should stay back until that is done. Okay. And uh, I also learned from that some, there are some mosques, like the Central Mosque of Lagos, whereby there are posters which all other mosques will have to actually uh, follow suit to yes. give you the guidelines okay. of how you come into the mosque, what you are expected uh, of doing in the mosque. Okay. We also have from reliable sources that most of the sermons yesterday, yes. you get what I'm saying, focus mm -hmm. on COVID-19 containment. Oh, fantastic. The, and the Islamic point of view to adhering to these um, um, social oh. distancing and other uh, measures yes. to uh, containing and curbing the spread of COVID-19 in our mosque. Okay. But I must tell you that a lot of mosques that would yeah, be able right. to do this now. Hmm. And our advice for them <laughs> is to stay back and see how it goes with those who have resources to do this at this point in time. We are also encouraging a situation whereby in order to reduce the number of people that will, troop, troop, uh, that will be coming into the mosque to the observe mosque. Jumat at yes. every at particular time, yes. in compliance with the government directives, we need to do what we call a uh, Jumat shift, okay. whereby some certain numbers will be allowed into the mosque okay. to observe Jumat prayer. An imam will lead the sermon and the prayer. Uh -huh. Then after which, another set of Muslims will come in oh, to also okay. observe their Jumat. Maybe you can have about three rounds of oh. this, depending on the number of people that do come to the mosque. So, to that, the, this is so that is allowed are, in from Islam. From my own organization, this is what we are promoting right now. Imam, because that is, is allowed in Islam. It's time to do that. Is that allowed in Islam? Is it Islamic? Very much have... allowed. Okay. It's just in putting that, uh, we have what we call the analogical, analogical deduction. Okay. The chaos shows us that when, for instance, you are in war front, you are in war front, mm. you are under fear and anxiety. Okay. You, you are not safe. And you need to observe your prayers. Yes. You, so you have to do that in, 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 uh, in sections. Okay. You sectionalize it. You share yourself why some people are outside taking care of your security, others go into the mosque and mm. pray. Mm. The, when you're finishing that, the other will come in and pray. So we are bringing that law into the COVID-19 uh, issue as far as Jumat service is concerned. And to me, I think, and to most of the scholars, this is, well, uh, this is a welcome uh, idea that we are quite uh, actually promoting. Within the time... All right. Um, Imam, I, w I want you to rest on that as I uh, call on Pastor Talks now. Pastor Talks, the church has put in so much to ensure that um, the COVID-19 protocols are observed, both um, social and medical. But I'm sure that there are requirements of the congregants, people that will be coming to church to worship. There are certain things that are required of them. What are those things that congregants are expected to do, both before coming into the church and when they are in church for worship? So, sorry, can you take that again? I said there are certain requirements of, con of the congregants, the people that are coming into the church to worship. What are they expected to do? What protocols are they expected to observe, both before coming into the church and when they are in church? Because right. the times are Thank different you. now. Thank you for that question. First of all, by the time they get to the church, at the entrance, at the entry point, we have 
uh, officials that will be there that will attend to them. First of all, you cannot enter without your face mask. That one is a standard one. And while at that entrance, we have um, some officials with the contact legs temperature measure. Okay. It's an infrared. So we have that one put in place. At each entrance, we have minimum of two ready to get the temperature of each worshiper that desires to come in. At the advent of having any temperature that is higher than the stipulated one, we have a uh -huh. place called an isolation place that we have made ready by ourselves so that we can actually take the person aside. God forbid we will not have such uh, a case, but we have made ready that. Then at the entrance, they need to wash their hand and also dry their hand, sanitize their hand, and they will be um, they will have to register. There has to be registration of everyone that will be coming to the church. We have some officials too ready with their tasks to help them, to give the information, the name, the address, okay. the number, and the gender, hmm. so that we can have that data in case of contact tracing. tracing. And by the time they get to the church, the church has already been arranged to give that social distance um, um, spacing yes. for each uh, worshiper. And they will also be guided by the ushers that will be in the church. And why in the church, minimal movement is expected. That's why the service, each service is 55 minutes. Mm. And during the service, we, we said that there will be a sort of jingle or, ad, or advert yes, that the on the screen will that will be going at some interval, yes. reminding us of the things that we ought not to do after the service. After the service, no congregating. After the service, no I-5, no nothing of such. And of course, during the offering, we are supposed to have the, um, the basket at different points. But to the people that can do electronic start transfer, we will encourage that. Okay. Before this time, we had already done the, the contamination of the church in the course of the week. Okay. After this service, we are going to be having our C-19 compliance team they are doing members the of decontamination. The that are appointed to be in this thing. They will sweep into the auditorium, get the place disinfected for the next service okay. and the next worshiper. And the entry point that the children do not come. How do we begin to, you know, ensure compliance with this? Are, are you talking to uh, 